UN um, ECOSOC representative for the Russian Academy of Natural Sciences and NGO A general consultative status. He served as the honorary consul um, general of the Russian Federation in Utah from 2002 to 2016, and as an associate vice president of international affairs and diplomacy at Utah Valley University until retiring in 2016. Dr. Rusty. Non-traditional student. Um, are you going to run this? I'll be helping you. Okay. You want to put yes, the first please. slide on? Yes, it's already okay. here. And uh, before, I would like to take you for the one of you. What do you think of that name? Good. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you need to think about its history and what it needs to be good about. Yeah? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, I was uh, appointed as Honorary Consul General of the Russian Federation and inducted at uh, Bravenel Hall in a ceremony that took place there in the year 2000. And uh, after that time, I was awarded several awards uh, by the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs in Moscow, uh, twice by the Consulate General in San Francisco, and once by the Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Kislyak in, uh, at the Embassy. Okay? Okay. You know, you're, you're going to have to stop taking pictures if you want to get this through in 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, immediately after, uh, the two years after, we had the uh, 2002 Olympic Winter Games, and I was in charge of all of the events at the Russia House. And this is uh, one of the displays of all of the sponsors of the Russian National Olympic Committee. And uh, every, every evening we would have a big reception. Uh, this reception right here happened to be uh, honoring the couple that won the figure skating, couple's figure skating gold medal. Uh, Anton and Elena, and they presented a nice uh, figure skating skate with their autographs on it. I have no idea who's got it now. But. And uh, many, many dignitaries. One of the dignitaries that came in from Moscow is uh, Valentina Matvienka, who is, was deputy prime minister at the time. And what is she now? And she is now the, uh, like the speaker of the house at the uh, Russian parliament in one of the... Of the Duma. Yeah, Duma. Very influential. And she is uh, the head person for, uh, in, in the security part of the, of the Duma. Next slide. Uh, as a result of the, uh, of the Olympics, uh, Mayor Lushkov, the mayor of Moscow, and Governor Levitt established the Moscow-Utah Youth Games. They put both teams, the entire Utah team, these were high school age youth, the entire high school, or Utah team and the entire Russia team in a secured hotel, took up the whole entire hotel that the city of Moscow did and put a, a, a major fence around it and it was a, a high security area. But the games consisted of all of the traditional things that you think of uh, they had a, a, a mind-blowing opening ceremony that only the city of Moscow could uh, afford. Next slide, please. This is the closing ceremony here, but uh, like you see, wrestling, water polo, gymnastics, basketball. Interestingly enough, you'd think, ah, oh, Utah can't do much against them. But the Utah girls beat the Moscow girls in soccer, of all things. I mean, Kingdom in soccer? That, that, that just, that blew my mind. Of course, we also creamed uh, Russia in baseball, naturally. They, they were still learning the game. Next slide, please. And then, in February of the next year, we held the, uh, uh, the winter-style games at uh, Rice Eccles Stadium. And that's the Olympic torch you see right there. The IOC permitted the Olympic torch in both Moscow and Salt Lake to be lit for both games. 
and to fly the official IOC flag, since Salt Lake and Moscow are both uh, uh, Olympic cities. Uh, I, I don't have many photos, but one of the highlights was that Mayor Lushkov of Moscow addressed the Utah State Senate. And uh, uh, it, it, was, it was a wonderful um, presentation that he made next. Now, we, we hosted many, many diplomatic guests in the state of Utah uh, over the course of, uh, since I came here in 1991 to UVU. Um, the president of Iceland in 1997, the permanent representative of India to the United Nations, Ambassador Puri and his wife. Uh, we always would take our guests to arches, now this is in the winter time, to arches, to take them skiing, whatever. Uh, the Dalai Lama, we hosted the Dalai Lama here. Uh, he's about to put the prayer shawl around my neck, uh, indicating, giving me a blessing. Um, the ambassador of uh, the People's Republic of China and his wife in 1999. These happened well before you came, Mr. Ambassador. So next one, please. Uh, more here, the permanent observer uh, uh, Al Kidwa, uh, Ambassador Al Kidwa of Palestine. I can't, I couldn't find the exact date that he came and spoke to the campus. Uh, the Archbishop Dimitri. We invited the Patriarch, Russian Orthodox Patriarch, and instead he sent uh, uh, he sent the the Archbishop of Tumen and Tobolsk which is the gas oil rich area of Russia. Uh, the translator was uh, John Valentine Jr., whose father was uh, later to become the president of the Utah State Senate. Ambassador Kislyak came twice uh, to uh, UVU. Kislyak, as you know, was the one, was the ambassador at the time when there was a big uh, brouhaha about <coughs> Russia influencing the elections. And if you knew him, you were interviewed by the FBI because they just knew that you were trying to uh, overthrow the elections, including me. I was interviewed as well. I told them I have no interest in overthrowing <laughs> elections. Uh, Arch, uh, Archbishop Ausa uh, of uh, the permanent observer of the Holy See to the United Nations, uh, also lectured on campus. Next one. We hosted a number of Library of Congress Open World delegations, quite a number, in fact, from former Soviet and former East Bloc countries. Uh, we were the preferred vendor uh, to the, for the Library of Congress to host these delegations, and we hosted many, man, many of them. Two from, uh, <coughs> from the Kyrgyz Republic. Uh, here is, uh, these are librarians. Uh, from Kyrgyzstan. This was a group of uh, government leaders of different levels, and this was not actually an open world, but it was the State Department's International Exchange uh, group. But we hosted many, many different ones. Next, please. Uh, in 2004, the uh, Governor Walker, who had met uh, President Akayev in uh, Bishkek, in Kyrgyzstan, invited uh, the president and his wife to come to UVU or come to Utah. Uh, they spoke, or she uh, she spoke, and received an honorary doctorate degree here uh, at UVU. They're in the governor's mansion there with Governor Walker. Uh, the uh, the president and uh, first lady with two lovely young. Utah children who happen to be my granddaughters. <laughs> they, they cherish that photo. Next. Now, uh, <clears throat> involvement in sustainable mountain development. In 2006, uh, UVU, together with uh, the International University of Kyrgyzstan, which had fairly deep roots into the United Nations, uh, became a member of the Mountain Partnership, which is under the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations in Rome. And we were the first academic institution in North America to become so affiliated and have been uh, 
very active ever since. I, I became the main focal point and uh, Ambassador Abdishayev here, Dr. Abdishayev became the second focal point. Next. Immediately we held Women of Mountain Conferences in 2007 was the first one. Uh, the uh, 2007 uh, Women of the Mountain Conference was uh, was very well attended. It was here on campus and in the area uh, where the fountain is or where the waterfalls are. Uh, we put up a, a huge yurt, a big yurt that uh, that came from the the oh, embassy, the right? Things. And uh, <clears throat> so we held that in 2007. And the major focus, as you can see, was to promote gender and the sustainable mountain development program. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was actually held four times. Next one, please. Um, the first one was in 2007, here on campus, as I explained. And the uh, conference hosted more than 120 participants from well over 20 countries. And these were, these were um, quite important people, including the, the governor of Utah, the governor of Montana, Montana both women. We had uh, greetings from the governor, uh, I think, of uh, Arizona. Of, of Arizona. Um, from Elena Bonner. Yes. Yes, uh, so, Andrei Sakharov. Uh, and uh, Andrei Sakharov's uh, widow, the, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, his widow. Uh, and we had greetings from the from the uh, Dalai Lama. Vice President of uh, uh, where, Costa Rica, I think it was. Anyway, and and this was these were noted in the Secretary General's report uh, in 2009 and 2007. Next, and President Onawa Foundation came here by uh, right <coughs> his own plane. You remember? <coughs> Now in 2011, uh, the, we held another Women of the Mountains conference here that had uh, over 100 participants from about 20 countries and international organizations. And this continued, but for the first time, the students became heavily involved in the organization. Not the old fuddy-duddy uh, faculty and staff, but the, the students actually became, uh, for the first time, involved in this. And uh, <clears throat> this led to a subsequent 2012 Women of the Mountains Conference in Puno, Peru. Uh, and it was called uh, Conferencia Internacional de... Bueno, de, de las Mujeres de los Andes, that was the name of it. Okay, next. In 2015, in 2015, this was entirely uh, uh, an SEL type of event for uh, Women of the Mountains. Uh, <clears throat> this, this was organized completely by students, by 79 students, committees of 79 students from UVU, University of Utah, and BYU. Uh, and this, this was done through the uh, Utah International Mountain Forum. And it was highlighted in the report of the 2016 report of the Secretary General of the United Nations. Very successful conference. Um, who, who are you? Who are you pointing to? This is uh, uh, Hendon's mom. mom. Oh. Dian, you see? She is sitting here. She is sitting right. together with the uh, Minister of uh, Tourism from uh, Nepal. Ne Nepal. My brother is also top left or yes. middle left. The yeah. blue uniform. Yes. Uh, the, this this woman right here, uh, uh, Kila Sherpa, she's the matriarch of the Sherpas, the Sherpa family in Nepal, and she runs a, 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 a tour, a trek organization, trekking organization in uh, Nepal. She invited me to come and do Mount Everest. <laughs> and she said, if you'll come and do Mount Everest, she said, my trekking company will put you in free. That's a $100,000 gift. We'll put you into the trek for free. And I said, there's a little problem. And there's a $50,000 tax 
to, to track Everest. And she said, well, she said, you happen to have, in, have invited and hosted the ambassador of Nepal, and he will waive the fee. <laughs> so, <laughs> so a free trek up Mount Everest. So unfortunately, my wife, my first wife uh, right there, uh, cancer uh, intervened, and it didn't happen. Next. This student engaged learning model really uh, didn't start taking uh, off in a huge way until approximately uh, 2011. And you all know what the student engaged learning model is. And it is heavily involved in working with non-traditional and traditional students together and having them become part of, there's two parts, the extracurricular part which was done through the Utah International Mountain Forum and the curricular part which is, involves connecting students with mentors at the university. Uh, and the UI, UIMF has become uh, quite a force for good uh, here on the campus it's, and it's a coalition of many different uh, foreign affairs related type of clubs. Next. Uh, one of the things that we did was uh, really promote the, the, the sustainable development goals that were eventually developed. Jester Molina, who was president of the UI, UIMF uh, at the time in, in 2013, um, actually went before the, 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 the group that, or the, the, the uh, body that was developing the Sustainable Development Goals and, and spoke to the two co-chairs in this, in this body. One of the co-chairs was Chava Corossi, who came here just last year to the university. And advocating for particularly these targets uh, and sustainable mountain development, which was really not included as it should be in the Sustainable Development Goals, and it's been pushed, we have tried to push ever since to get more uh, involvement in what is happening in our mountains. Next. Uh, through the sustainable, uh, through the SEL uh, program, we were able to host a number of people. Uh, this is Chaba Corossi uh, as the permanent representative of Hungary when he visited in 12, 2012. Last year, he came back as the president of the General Assembly and spoke to us. And this was all done through the students. The students in, uh, through the SEL uh, were heavily involved in this. This, it, this was an important meeting. Uh, Ambassador, Ambassador Sajik of Austria was president of the Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, when he came here. Uh, very powerful uh, uh, body at the United Nations. I found out he loved to ski, and so we spent two days skiing as guests of the mayor of Park City, and we skied every run on Deer Valley for free. <laughs> Equipment, everything was free. That was, it's, yeah, this was a tough job, I have to <laughs> ne Next, please. We also had uh, many other ambassadors that were, came here from uh, through SEL. Uh, the, the president of the General Assembly from Fiji, uh, Peter Thompson. Uh, we became good friends. Uh, Ambassador Mil uh, Mikolescu from Romania with the lieutenant governor at the time. Uh, Ambassador Puri and his wife. Uh, I didn't realize that she was the uh, deputy executive director of UN Women. In, in the UN, she was much higher than he was. So, and I didn't realize it. This was the provost at the time, Ian Wilson. Next. Uh, more uh, ambassador of uh, Macedonia, uh, Kyrgyz. Uh, uh, this, the Paul Sager, Paul Sager of Switzerland, uh, um, gave me this tie when he got back home. He sent it to me. He says, I know you're a hobby beekeeper and this is full of bees. So I carry my own beehive with me on the 
this guy. And, and he is mentioned in the book. Uh, please, uh, uh, if you notice, guys, they were discussing, uh, helping come out to do the things. And it just so happened we were up at the we we happened to be up at the state capitol when uh, a whole group of uh, indigenous people from the state of Utah, Navajo, and others were putting on a big program. And we stepped out of the capitol, and here they were doing this program right right below us. And I said, Ambassador, this is just for you. <laughs> well, he thought it was magnificent. I mean, all the costuming and everything. Next, please. Uh, advocating again, uh, Michael Spinellis from uh, Greece, uh, Dr. Yingo from uh, Romania, and uh, uh, His Excellency uh, Ambassador Baum from Germany. These were all SEL type of students through UIMF. Next. Okay, we have the ambassador from. Uh, he, he was the ambassador to the United States, wasn't yes. he? So he was one of your replacements. Yeah. <laughs> and then he went to Brussels. In, in 2013. And then last year, this is when Chapa Corossi is the president of the United, uh, as the United Nations General Assembly came here. Uh, I, I, how many of you met him? Okay, there's... Not here, but in New York. Okay, in New York, okay. And uh, we, I, I took a group uh, to New York just uh, the year before, and uh, we met him and, and talked with him. So that was in his office. And that was where my, my, my new bride here, uh, she didn't want to come to this. And if she hadn't come to it, I would not have dated her. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she came to it, and we eventually decided to get married. So. Uh, next, please. Uh, advocating SMD at the United Nations through the Russian Academy of Natural Sciences. I was, in, I was uh, inducted into the Russian Academy of Natural Sciences and uh, was main, uh, appointed as the main representative at the United Nations ECOSOC for, for it. <clears throat> and because of the Russian Academy, We've been able to do a number of things, attend sessions of the CSW, Commission on Status of Women, co-host parallel events, submit written statements advocating for sustainable mountain development to the UN Secretariat, and to apply for oral statements during the general debates of the CSW. Uh, in honor of my retirement in 2016, uh, <clears throat> The ambassador of Hungary and her husband <coughs> held a, an intimate dinner in their flat <coughs> in New York City. Um, they had become very good friends with Peter Seger, the president of the UN General Assembly, and his wife, and my dear friend Vitaly Churkin, the ambassador of Russia, and his wife. And these were probably three of the closest uh, couples, that uh, friends, that I made at the time. Next. Uh, continuing the advocacy through the Russian Academy of Natural Sciences, the, uh, through the SEL model, this was in 2019, in March of 2019. Um, and through the participation sessions of the Commission on Status of Women, we were able to push for international women's and gender related uh, issues. And here you, here you see in the uh, 2019 and the 2018 um, General Assembly and ECOSOC uh, statements about the activities that we had done. And these were student. Even though, even though I was involved with the Russian Academy of Natural Sciences, as is uh, Ambassador Avdusayev, we decided that it was students, wanted to push students, didn't want to do anything ourselves. That way, the students had more opportunities. Next. The SEL model results. Since 2006, uh, UVU and UIMF have contributed to, to a number of gender-related things. We regularly hosted the Women of the Mountains 
four different conferences. Since 2011, advocated for sustainable mountain development through the SEL model. Advocated for many mar mountain targets in the sustainable mountain, uh, er, I should say, SDGs. Uh, from 2013-2015. Annually observed Interna International Mountain Day here at UVU. Uh, and also we started out by uh, celebrating International Women's Day when it, when it was nothing here in the United States. The first, the first time we celebrated International Mount or Women's Day here on campus, it blew people away because they'd never heard of it. And now everybody celebrates it. And what we did is we brought roses for all of the women who attended the, the conference. You remember? Nice long stem rose. Uh, anyway, um, and as a recognition, the United Nations Secretary General report has six times since 2007 recognized UVU, the only academic institution that they've done so in North America. Next, please. The SEL model, opportunity for lifelong learning, uh, developed uh, the model implements of uh, a sustainable development goal four, which aims to read that, ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. It allows everyone to get involved and contribute at any stage of life. It allows everybody to get educated at any stage of life. Now, I'm standing before you as the ultimate non-traditional student, father of seven, with my wife uh, 13, with my wife 20, 55 grandchildren, and how many great-grandchildren now? 20, 24. Yeah, <laughs> great-grandchildren. I'm 84 years old. I'm, I'm a, a lifelong learner, non-traditional student. I'm as non-traditional as you'll ever see. Next so I need to take the uh, uh, best photos of you. Then later you know, see, you'll say, where's my photo? <laughs> okay, That's again. Thank you. And I, I, I brought this cap because this was Team Utah for the Moscow Utah Youth Games. And, uh, and this is what we wore to Moscow in 2003. New Ways was the sponsor of the Boeing 777, which flew us, and it was interesting, at the Salt Lake International Airport to see up there Aeroflot, first time Aeroflot had ever, Aeroflot flight number whatever it was, Salt Lake to Moscow, direct <laughs> flight. And then in the, uh, in the Charmetovo International Airport in Moscow, uh, Moscow, Russia, the big reader board up there, SU, uh, um, I should say, Aeroflot, flight number 323 to Salt Lake City. I mean, Rome, Tokyo, Singapore, Salt Lake City. <laughs> it was something else. But that was, uh, it was a wonderful experience. Questions? I'll take any question you've got. In a similar way, we had for the first time ever two TU-154 Russian made uh, Kyrgyz airplane with the Kyrgyz symbolic uh, for the first time ever landed in uh, Salt Lake. After that, uh, flew over to the Provo uh, for the first time, and it was a. Uh, um, no, even airport in Provo, I guess. It in, uh, airport. Yes, it was also in. Uh, Doctor Patero is everything, you know. If you uh, dealing with him, he could do uh, everything. No, that that was that was President Akayev's. Uh, um, Air Force One equivalent. At that time. The, the, yeah, that came in here to Salt Lake and then uh, into Provo. And it was interesting because President Dukayev and his wife came to Utah, not to, not to Washington, D.C. They came directly to Utah from Bishkek, so. Yes. <laughs> one more time. <laughs> Good. I can't believe you and your family. <laughs> Anyway, I'm open to questions. Um, what got you, or maybe inspired you, or what was the process of choosing this as a career path? 
This career path? Well, yeah. you wouldn't believe it because my PhD was in linguistics. Uh, but I, I, I worked for the uh, U.S. Senate and for the White House. <clears throat> when I worked for the U.S. Senate <clears throat> in Washington, D.C., I became very heavily involved in hosting, um, or, or not necessarily hosting, but becoming involved in uh, receptions and, and whatnot for dignitaries from other countries. And that piqued a lot of interest uh, in all things international. Um, uh, I eventually wound up uh, with the Boeing Corporation and its military airplanes, uh, which uh, put me in heavy contact eventually with uh, Russia's SAGI. SAGI is the acronym for the, for the, uh, uh, let's see, SAGI, the Central Aerohydrodynamic Institute, which would be the equivalent of NASA on steroids. <laughs> really, anything that has ever flown in space or in the air came out of SAGI. And I became heavily involved with them, and I became their editor for all of their, for many of their publications, which absolutely cheesed off the FBI. I mean, I, they couldn't, nobody could touch me while I was the Honorary Consul General, but the minute I retired, I was called in and two FBI agents grilled me for five hours solid. One of the questions they asked me, one of the questions that I, I nearly got them walked out, are you now or have you ever been an agent, a covert agent for the Russian Federation? <coughs> no. That wasn't my answer. My answer was absolutely not. So, anyway, um, but uh, one thing led to another. I, uh, I eventually moved out of Boeing, came here to Utah. Uh, I was hired by the uh, city of Provo, the mayor of Provo, uh, Jenkins, and by Kerry Romsberg, the president of Utah Valley Community College, to help uh, work together with the airport, with the uh, developing commercial, more commercial opportunities for the airport in Provo. Well, eventually, Kerry Roseberg said, uh, we want to pay your salary exclusively, forget the city of Provo, and come to UVU, or come to UVCC, which I did, and I, I came as his assistant to the president. And then, um, then we, I, I don't know how it happened, but there started becoming some, there's some international figures showed up, I think, through the, uh, through the BYU program. And I thought, well, gee whiz, uh, I wonder if they'd share them, if they'd let that, that ambassador at BYU come over and speak here. And they did, several times. And then, uh, then I asked them at BYU, I said, do you do anything with ambassadors at the United Nations? And they said, nope. I said, okay, that's fair game. I mean, you handle the ambassadors in Washington, and so then I, I went to New York and met, uh, I went through the LDS Church Public and International Affairs. I knew the, the man that was head of that, his name is Ahmed Corbett, and, uh, and Ahmed took me and introduced me to a number of ambassadors, and I just asked each one of them, how'd you like to come to Utah sometime? Every one of them said yes. And so then what I had to do is I had to come back to the, to, the, to the president's office and the provost's office and say, I need a budget. And uh, so they gave me a little bitty, bitty budget, enough to get a couple of ambassadors here and whatnot. And then I went to a, a, a person who was a very well-to-do individual, and I said, I need money for this. And so that individual said, how much do you need? I said, well, how about two hundred fifty thousand dollars? <laughs> well, from then on, that individual wrote me a check for two hundred fifty thousand dollars every year. I never used any university money for anything of this program, and the president loved it because <laughs> so, I could I could elevate I could help elevate 
the school to a much higher level on an international level at no cost to the university. And, uh, and uh, I, Matt Holland, when he was the president of the university here, I, when he first came, I explained to him what I'm doing and he said, if it's not costing the university anything, you go ahead, and wh which I continue to do. And because of that, we have had scores, literally scores, of ambassadors and other senior United Nations personnel come. And occasionally, I would get a phone call from uh, LDS Public and International Affairs in Washington, D.C., who would say, BYU isn't interested in this ambassador, but we love him. How would you like to have that ambassador come? This was one of them. <laughs> in 1999. 1999. One millennium ago. And they, I remember the call and said, there's this couple that is just fantastic. He's the ambassador of the Kyrgyz Republic and his wife. And BYU doesn't want to host them. But we want them to come to Utah. I said, don't worry, we'll cover it. So we brought them to Utah, and the rest is history. They stayed eventually. So, other questions? We have a couple of minutes, guys. But so so the, the, the roundabout answer to the question is that it, it, it was almost serendipitous. Yeah. OK. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so what advice would you just have for us students? Like, the advice to help um, our like, future careers progress? Keep your eyes open for anything. I mean, with a PhD in linguistics, what's that got to do with what I wound up doing? Pretty much nothing. But I, I, I kept my eyes open and to, to opportunities. Um, I have a son who survived nine major layoffs at Intel. He should have been in there. And I said, how did you do it? He said, easy. Because I could tell the layoffs were just what Intel did. And what I would do is I would take the department that I was in charge of and I would look at something that no one else is doing in Intel that was really important and I would draw experts into mine and whenever they'd talk to me about layoffs and I'd say well if you lay off how are you what are you going to do with this you're handling that yeah well since when <laughs> you know and he kept doing that and he kept building in other words, he had vision. Okay, he didn't. He didn't exclude anything. So that's one thing I'd do. Another thing is get as much education as you can, and network, 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 network like crazy. When you meet someone uh, that's up here at this level, network with them, befriend them. Um, do things with them or for them or whatever because that person knows someone's higher than they are etc and it just goes on and on one thing leads to another it seems like and that that's what happened with me is i had a i just had i began to develop a network of international people or people is affiliated in international areas and one thing led to another and it, and that's what that's where I uh, landed. You see how the uh, president of Jenny Assembly, he came just there as a regular ambassador in 12. And then after that, uh, uh, Dr. Butler now is keeping that uh, uh, contact, uh, what is Saba uh, Koroshi is doing in Hungary, and he's planning five years from now what to do with him. With another uh, ambassador who is uh, from Georgia, uh, continue to keep uh, this relations. Now he is a, a regional representative in Central Asia, and still he is in touch and continues to work. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, and we are just using him, saying, would you please, Dr. Bar, what do you think? Like last year. The yeah, ambassador of, of the Republic of Georgia, I met him and I thought, Wow, you know, we have, uh, in Springville, we have a, a Museum of Russian Art. Well, it's a Museum of Art, but it's a 
huge Russian collection. And lo and behold, I found out that they also have a large Georgian collection down in the basement. So we invited the ambassador of Georgia here and, and I asked them to put on their Georgian collection. And we took him, he was blown away. He saw one painting, an original painting, that he grew up with a copy of that in his home as a boy. And he said, I remember that painting, and here was the original. And, and then there was a lady who said, up in Park City, who said, when they tore down some of the uh, opera house in Tbilisi, they, tore, they, they were going to destroy these beautiful paintings on canvas that were there. And she said, I went in and asked them, what are you going to do with that? We're going to tear it down. Can I take those? So she carefully stripped uh, the canvas. Beautiful, beautiful original paintings. Dr. Butler, sorry, no, we don't have time or the left here. Because the guys <laughs> don't come, I'll stop uh, again recording and then. Uh, stop, we, I'll, I'll finish the story. To, we need to do. Uh, and what did she do? She presented those paintings sorry, Jacob. to the ambassador. Thank you. And they're in the embassy, in the Georgian embassy in Washington. <laughs>